is going on, everybody? Welcome to Trail Tales, the podcast where I, Kyle O'Grady, a through hiker and peak bagger, chat with other through hikers, peak baggers, and hiking experts about their experiences on the trail. Now, today on episode 13, I'm joined by my friend Jessica Poo, otherwise known as Little Bear on the Trail, and we are going to bring you a straight up classic episode of Trail Tales where we talk all about the Appalachian Trail. Now, Jessica and I met on the AT this past summer, and we were both able to successfully complete our through hikes. We talk about a bunch of different topics today, including ultralight backpacking gear, hiking with a significant other, and Jessica even spills the beans about some of the things that she was the most afraid of before and during her through hike. It was a great chat. Jessica, when you hear this, I really, really appreciate you taking the time to come on the program this week. We're going to get into the episode in just a moment here, but first, I made a promise a number of episodes ago to read any five-star review I get on iTunes out loud at the beginning of the next episode. Now, I think I actually skipped a week or two for this review, but I'm still going to get to it. So, Mr. Disc Golf Danny on iTunes writes... Loved the Arizona Trail episode, would love to hear some more about the trails out west. And he gave the show a five-star review, which is freaking awesome. So Disc Golf Danny, (laughs) thank you very much for the review. I'm glad you liked the Arizona Trail episode. And if you want to hear more about trails out west, you are in luck. Because next week, I'm going to be having a conversation with a gentleman who thru-hiked the Pacific Crest Trail this past year. So I'm really looking forward to that. I hope you are too, and I hope you enjoy it i'd love to do more episodes on trails uh that exist in the west so yeah if you have any ideas about that any trails you'd like me to cover let me know and you're probably wondering after that sentence kyle how can i let you know what trails i want you to cover well there's an easy easy answer to that you can hit me up on social media that's right i am on twitter and instagram i have a facebook page for the show as well but i don't use it honestly i don't even use my twitter that much either so instagram is probably your best bet but hey if you're into twitter then feel free to toss me a follow on there as well at trail tales pod that is the handle for instagram and twitter but let's say you don't trust those big social media companies and you don't really mess with instagram and twitter you don't really know what those things are or you just don't like those things There's another way that you can still contact me and give me some suggestions or talk some shit or just say hi. You can contact me on email. That's right, my favorite form of electronic communication, trailtalespod at gmail.com. I've gotten a few emails over the past couple weeks. Feels good to finally get some feedback and I want some more. So please send me an email. Tell me what you like about the show. Tell me what you don't like about the show. I don't know. Like I said, talk some shit. Just Tell me some hiking facts, or how about some subjects you'd like me to talk about with my next guest, or any of that stuff. What I'm trying to say here is just send me an email. I would really, really appreciate it. So, yeah, I think that's about all I have for the introduction. Why don't we Why don't we get into it? Let's do it. Episode number 13, with my good friend Jessica Poo, Little Bear, Appalachian Trail Class of 2018. <laughs> want to say any questions before we start uh nope okay let's do it ready this is how we're gonna start the episode oh actually oh, oh i already cracked it <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> no more actuallys we're going this is trail tales episode number 13 i'm here with jessica Pooh, otherwise known as little bear right now it is dumping snow here in vermont i'm going to be snowed in for the next couple days I think because my car doesn't do very well in the snow but Jessica is down in Florida I believe where I can almost guarantee you it is not snowing is that correct yeah it's beautiful here it's beautiful here I'm kind of jealous I know the largest percentage of my very small amount of listeners are actually in Florida so I'm jealous of you guys right now anyways welcome to trail tales Jessica and I hiked 
on the Appalachian Trail together from, what was it, uh, Gorham, New Hampshire. Yeah, I haven't even taken a sip of this beer yet, but I'm already starting to forget shit. <laughs> Gorham, New Hampshire, all the way to Katahdin, kind of on and off together. And another fun fact about Jessica, she is Baker Bocorny, who I believe was our guest on episode number, oh boy, nine or ten. He was the Florida Trail guy, for those of you that listened to that episode. Anyways, Jessica is Baker's fiance, and she was nice enough to take some time out of her day today and on Thursday, which was two days uh, back from now because we tried to record then, but we had some technical difficulties. Anyways, Jessica, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show today. What's going on? Not much. I don't have to cook dinner tonight because I'm doing this, so that's nice. Ooh, excuse to not cook dinner. <laughs> that, sounds, <laughs> that sounds great. So... Jessica, to start off our conversation here, I kind of want to ask you the same thing that I ask all my guests, as I'm sure you are familiar, because I know you've just listened to every single episode and you're a huge fan, right? No. All um, one. So how did you learn about long distance hiking in general? And then what gave you the idea to do a through hike of the entire Appalachian Trail? Oh man, I wish I could say that it was something that like... I've always wanted to do or it was a dream, but really I learned about it through Baker um, and he was really smart about it. He started me out with some like shorter, easy trips on really beautiful days and really beautiful places. So like we, we did a week long trip in the, um, the Smokies yep. where we got to see the solar eclipse. I think you mentioned that um, and that was just beautiful. We had stellar weather and it was amazing. Um, and then we also did a week long trip in Kentucky at Red River Gorge, I think. And that was also stunning and beautiful. Um, and so I just, he gave me a lot of really good experiences and so it got me interested. Um, and the final thing that made me want to do like the Appalachian Trail was um, home, homemade wanderlust videos. I saw them and oh, it just okay. seemed like, I, she was very realistic on like, you know, what it involved and what she went through. And it was like, it made me think like, well, I think I could do that. I think I can handle that. Yeah. Um, and then it was good timing with school to just like take a break after school and not go straight into working. Okay. So that's something that a lot of people have questions about often is like how do you like find time to do you know a four or five month whatever through hike so can you just talk a little bit about like what your life circumstances are i know you just said you're in school but can you kind of just like elaborate on that a little bit more and kind of talk about how you were able to fit in a through hike into you know your otherwise very busy life um yeah so it just again kind of like with what you did like right after school it just was a good time to take a break um i was doing pharmacy school um, and I graduate. So after you graduate, you have to get go through like a licensing process before you can start cooking. Um, so I just decided to delay that licensing process and um, take off the summer in order to hike. Um, we were able to do it mostly because Baker had already been working for a few years. So we had money saved up for the yep. two of us because there was no way I was going to work enough to save up several thousand during school. So it was just, it was just good timing for both of us. Yep. No, that makes sense. Yeah, because like you said, that's kind of how I did it too after right after school is done. I understand that for a lot of people, that's not possible because they're just not like in school anymore. But uh, I don't know. I think when I have some, some older people on the show, just I say older, I just mean people that aren't like right out of college, mm -hmm. early 20s, kind of like me. Um, I think I'm going to try to work that question in a little bit more because I am kind of curious how other people, you know, that have different life circumstances than myself kind of find the time to, to do a through hike like that. And that is something that, you know, potential people that are considering doing a through hike or at least interested in doing a through hike ask about a lot. But yeah, absolutely. I feel like everyone was our age or um, retired. <laughs> yeah, pretty <laughs> much. Most of the people on the trail. I mean, that is like a, a trend that I've noticed as well. It's like a lot. I don't want to say most people, but like uh, definitely a majority of people from my understanding anyways are either like younger, maybe early to mid twenties or, you know, retired. I guess that thirties, forties age range isn't really represented as heavily as those other ages. But I mean, that kind of makes sense too. Cause that's like the, I'm having a family and getting married <laughs> and being like a real person kind of <laughs> age. So I don't know, saving mm -hmm. money, all that stuff. But anyways, so I kind of want to talk about your hike on the AT a little bit. Now, we're going to jump right into a subject that I talked a little bit with Baker about on his episode. Again, I can't remember the, na the 
can't remember the number of that episode, but um, that is the subject of hiking with a partner because as people that heard that episode will remember, that's just the fact that you and Baker hiked the entire trail together is just something that kind of fascinates me because I feel like a lot of couples just like couldn't do that. And that's maybe that's kind of insulting of me to say, but I don't know. Like I, I think everybody will agree, you know, two significant others hiking over 2000 miles together over the course of four or five, six months is something that's pretty incredible. So I kind of want to talk a little bit about that. So I guess the first question we're going to start out with here is just very general, but I think it's kind of the million dollar question when it comes to this subject. So what advice would you give to other couples that are looking to do a full long distance through hike? I think the most important thing is that communication is absolutely key. If you're not able to communicate with each other clearly and effectively in real life, you're not going to be able to do it on the trail when you're stressed out. So like that's, you know, includes little things like, you know, I need a break now, or I'm feeling frustrated because this, or I, you know, little things like that. Like today I'd like to stay in town and being able to communicate those effectively and compromise And then the other thing I would say is it's really important to talk about before you leave what you're going to do if somebody has to quit, right? Like we talked about that before we left of like, if one of us quits, does the other person keep hiking? Do we both have to stop? Um, So things like that. And we actually did end up hiking. I hiked for a while without Baker um, in the Smokies, like he said, because he had his injury. Um, And that ended up being a thing. And actually in Maine, I almost quit at one point too. And so you almost quit in Maine. (laughs) I know, I know. (laughs) Jessica, I didn't. Just, I didn't. Because I remember, like, I th- I feel like I kind of remember that time, and I I feel like you might be kind of misrepresenting what it was when you said you almost quit. Like, I feel like you like were just frustrated, and like in that moment, you kind of wanted to quit. But like, don't don't tell me you like actually considered quitting, did you? I I really did. Oh man. I, okay. Well, I guess I'm wrong then. But jeez. Yeah, we can we can talk more about that later if you want. But like that, it was. I I seriously contemplated it. I was very serious about potentially quitting. No, fuck that. We're going to talk about it right now because <laughs> I will I will forget. Otherwise. Okay, this is, yeah, this is not on my notes or whatever. We'll get back to the sig- significant other hiking partner thing in a second, but just tell me what happened there. Like, I honestly, because like I just said, at the time, I remember you were frustrated and that was a hard, I remember this section of trail that you were uh, talking about. I believe it was the section from like around the Mahusik Notch area in Southern Maine, right? Mm-hmm, yeah, it was yeah. Southern Maine. Because that was a hard... St- hard section because I've, t- I've talked about it on the show before like that's probably in my opinion the most challenging physically challenging part of the whole trail mm-hmm. that 10 miles either direction from Mahusik Notch but uh, I don't know yeah what what happened there I I really am curious now <laughs> <laughs> so it was it was mostly that I I developed a lot of fear around that section um, I was very like you know in southern Maine it's not just that this trail is challenging but that there's a lot of really steep descents where there's these huge granite rock slabs and they go on forever and there's there's no trees, there's no cracks in the rocks and it's like there's nothing to grab onto, right? Like if you were to slip, you would just slide for like hundreds of feet. Oh, yeah. Yeah, or there were some where it was like rock scrambles to get down when you were hand over hand climbing and it got to a point where I didn't, I wasn't enjoying the trail anymore because every time we would climb, all I could think about was how scary the descent was going to be because I was, it wasn't just like a, it was hard or challenging it was just that it was I was literally afraid that I was going to fall and hurt myself and for me it was like at this point is this worth it to keep putting myself at risk because like you know Baker didn't have any trouble with these things but like for me like there were times when I had to I would like have to turn around backwards and hang down from a rock and then let go and drop a few feet before I would even hit ground and that was just like I just got really tired of that and I at the top of they came to a peak at the top of Mahusik Arm Uh, we had climbed we were climbing that and I had fallen once on the way up there um, and I had slid a few feet down the rock and had to like spread eagle to grab the rock and stop sliding down this mountain. And I just, I remember I like curled up and I curled up after I stopped and just laid there for a minute. Like, what am I Ugh. doing? <laughs> Why am I doing this? This is awful. And then for the rest of the climb up, all I could think about was like, Oh my God, what is the other side going to be like? Yeah. Which it's not bad at all. <laughs> it, no, it really, who's like arm actually coming down off the other side of the arm is not actually that bad at all. But we, you know, I remember we got to the top and it was like fairly early in the morning and it should have been beautiful, right? Like it should have been amazing. There were 
wispy clouds rolling over the mountain. The valley mm-hmm. was full of clouds. The sun was shining down on it, little mountain peak islands in, in the valley. And I remember Baker was like in awe and he was like just amazed. And I stood there and like all I could think about was the descent. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, and I was just like, this, why am I doing it at that point, right? Like I'm not, um, I'm not enjoying it anymore. And I actually didn't tell him that at that time I was considering quitting for a couple of days because I wanted to sit on it, right? One of the things we talked about was that nobody would quit on a bad day. Yeah. And I was like, all right, this is a bad day. I've fallen. I'm not enjoying myself. I'm going to give it until range late. And if I ha- don't feel better about the trail then, then I'll quit. Wow. So you would really like put some thought into that. That's a, see, I, yeah. like I said before, I th- I thought it was just kind of like a, you were pissed off and frustrated at that <laughs> section of the trail. Cause that section of the trail is tough. Like I just said yeah. uh, earlier, but, um, I didn't realize you were actually like full on, like considering quitting. So, yeah. wow. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't enjoy any of the peaks in Southern Maine. Like I remember the saddlebacks, like Baker stopped at the top of every saddle, like or whatever horn, I think is what they were called. Yeah, yeah. Um, and enjoyed the view. And I just trudged past him every time. Like I got to get over this mountain before nightfall. I've got to get down before it's dark. I don't even care about this view. I just want to get off this mountain. And it was like, you know, that was, you know, why I was considering quitting. It was like, nothing was beautiful anymore to me, even though yeah. Maine is objectively beautiful. You also got to keep in mind that like at this point, we're in our last state, like we've gone almost mm-hmm. 2000 miles at this point. So I feel like, I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I, so I guess I'll ask, do you think just the fact that you were in the home stretch, basically of your through hike and you were kind of worn out because of that, like, do you think that played a factor in your kind of mindset there as well? Yes and no. Um, when we were hiking, Baker and I, we, you know, we started late like you did, um, and we had timed ourselves, right? And we knew that up until the uh, M- Musilak, we had to average 23 and a half miles a day, and we had like four zeros or something like that um, to in order to get to Musilak by September 1st, which would then mean we had a month to get to Maine, right? And that was like our mantra was like, we just got to get to Musilak on September 1st. And then we can slow down and we can start enjoying the trail. <laughs> and then we got there and we 15 miles was really hard to do. Yeah. And so we, I, I, all of that had just been like the rug had been pulled out. Like, no, the rest of the trail isn't easy. We're not going to get to, you know, do the thing where we build campfires every night and like hang out every night. Um, <clears throat> we're still going to hike from dawn to dusk every day, which is what I had been looking forward to not doing anymore. Mm-hmm. So that was, took an emotional toll. And then, I also had an issue with um, right around the whites. I started <clears throat> having issues with muscle wasting because I wasn't, I, I don't think I was getting enough protein. Um, mm-hmm. And so I think that's why I started falling so much. And that was part of what made me so scared is how much I was falling. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. That uh, Southern Maine, I'm sure people who are familiar with the AT are sick of hearing this, but yeah, Southern Maine is definitely the hardest part of the trail. <laughs> I mean, the whites are hard too, but I don't know. There's just something about it that in particular, I can't remember if I've said this before, but the section, in my opinion, the section from the main border, main New Hampshire border, north to Grafton Notch, which is uh main state road 26, I believe it goes into uh, Bethel, Maine, that mm-hmm. section of the trail. I think it's, it's gotta be uh, maybe less than 20 miles, maybe between like 15 mm-hmm. or 20 miles or something like that. So not a long section, but that section in particular, I think is the hardest, physically the hardest section of the entire trail. And I remember when I went through, I thought I had it rough, but honestly, Mullet Mike, the guy who has been on the show before, and uh, people might've heard me say that I hiked most of the AT with him. He was getting sick right around the time that we left Gorham, New Hampshire, Mm -hmm. and kind of got to the main border there. And... Not only that, but the day that we went through, you know, that arguably hardest section of the whole trail, he broke both his, or he broke one of his trekking poles and lost the other one. Like the worst part is we had just gotten out of the Mahusik Notch. Like we had just gotten through the boulders. Like he made it through that. And then right before we like stopped to take a lunch break or something, I get, I don't, I didn't see it happen, but I kind of heard it because he was behind me. He like went down on one of his poles and it snapped and then he like fell and he like threw the other one oh. somehow and he lost it. Like he couldn't <laughs> find it afterwards. So like just in that a sp- split second, he lost both of his trekking poles. He's in the hardest section of the entire trail at this point, And he's also like sick and he ended up That's going so into brutal. town 
the next day because he he had to rest up because he was not feeling well. So yeah, yeah. pour him all at Mike. All right. <laughs> On that note, did we tell you we ended up night hiking the notch? I th- oh, we didn't I... mean to, but we accidentally night hiked part of the notch. <laughs> Oh, fuck that. That sounds terrible. <laughs> it was. Wow. Oh, I, I didn't expect to go on like a 15 minute sorry. side tangent. Oh, no, don't be sorry. I was asking about it, uh, about that. But, you know, I try to keep this as unscripted as possible because honestly, I don't think I'm smart enough to follow a script very well anyways. So <laughs> on that note, let's get back to uh, talking about hiking with a partner a little bit. Um, honestly, I can't even remember what you were saying about giving advice for those who are, oh wait, I remember you said that you recommend having a plan beforehand about what happens if somebody quits and kind of mm-hmm. compromising. I mean, you kind of have to compromise a little bit on, you yeah. know, what you're doing, I guess yeah. on that note, one of the questions I have written down here is like, can you talk a little bit more specifically about like what some of the things that you were compromising with Baker on like were um well it wasn't so much as a compromise of like you know you have to be able to explain why you're feeling a certain way otherwise the person's like well why do you need to sit down right now why do you need to do this whatever um but it was just little things like um when we needed to stay in town you know like if Baker could tell that I was getting kind of like twitchy about it or or I had I had one time where I don't know what happened but my clothes were making me itchy and then we went like I think almost, I think we went three weeks. I think we went three weeks without doing laundry. Oh, wow. And every day my clothes would make me itchy and it was brutal and painful. And finally, we, we were just getting out of the Shenandoah. I was like, we have to stop in town because my clothes are making me itchy and I have to wash them. We're taking a night. <laughs> <laughs> and so like, you know, compromising on little things like that and things like, um, I think he compromised a lot too on like mileage every day because I was very much like a go, go, go kind of person. Like if we weren't doing big miles, I wasn't feeling good about it. So, like, I would be like, no, we can't sit here for two hours at lunch. We need to keep going. We need to keep walking. Mm-hmm. We shouldn't stop yet. Um, and then other things like, you know, Baker sometimes wanted to night hike, but I was really scared of hiking at night. And frequently, you know, we would have to just agree, like, this is where we have to stop because yeah. the sun has already gone down. Um, so mostly it was just when do we stop in town and when do we need to stop for breaks is what we had to compromise on. Right, right. No, that makes sense. And you guys would actually – from my understanding hike like hike hike together during the day because a lot of people that are hiking with partners will like you know plan out where they're going to meet at the end of the day but then they won't actually like hike together during the day but you two were actually like you know right beside or not beside each other (laughs) i don't think the trail's wide enough for that you guys were like right (laughs) you know in front of and behind each other when you were hiking Mm -hmm. right yeah which i guess kind of throws in even more sort of compromising because now Not only do you have to compromise on, like, the town stops and, you know, how far you're going to go for the day, but you even have to kind of compromise on just things like, like you, like you just said a minute ago, like, where are we going to stop for lunch and how long and all that stuff. So I guess that adds just a whole nother kind of layer in as well. So another question, or I guess it's not even a question. Another thing that we had kind of talked about when we were trying to like brainstorm some topics Uh, You had made a comment that kind of when you were reflecting on your experience, you kind of, you and Baker kind of realized that your experiences were like very, I guess, I think the words you used were very different from each other, even though you, you know, hiked the whole trail together. And as I just said, like literally hiked together for most of the time. So can you just kind of talk like about that? I'm kind of curious, like what were, like how were your experiences different? Yeah, so like, you know, in terms of what we saw, we saw the same thing at the same time pretty much every day. But we actually had two like completely different emotional experiences on the trail. Like when we were um, back home and talking with his parents about things, we dad would ask like, what was your favorite moment on trail? And we had like different answers or like, what was your favorite section of the trail? And we had different answers. Okay, I guess kind of going off of that, when he asked you your favorite moments on the trail there, like what, what, like what was yours and what did uh, Baker say that his was? So for me, it was like, um, again, like I said, I'm a go, go, go kind of person. Like if I like doing big miles. Um, and so when we, we went from Harper's Ferry to Carlisle, Pennsylvania in like, like just under four days, like on the fourth day at like 4 PM, we were in Carlisle. Oh, wow. And I think that's a little over a hundred miles. It's like 104, 106, something like that. And like, so even though that was a section where it like rained every day and it was, you know, 
Um, we're beginning to get a little bit into the rocks of Pennsylvania, just a little bit, those little small ones. Um, and it, the trail was flooded everywhere. Our feet were soaked. We ended up taking a double zero in Carlisle because Baker had infected blisters and I had some sort of allergic reaction to KT tape that I had on my feet. Ooh. And so I had just a horrible rash that turned into blisters later. Wait, um, this is your favorite section? What are you talking about? It, <laughs> it is. I know. Terrible. It's crazy. It's crazy. I know. But like, because that was the first time we did four 26 plus miles days in a row. And I just like, I felt so strong. We were hiking so fast and we were accomplishing so many miles. And so like for me, like when I look back, like that's the moment I'm like most proud of, okay. like the moment I have like the best feelings associated with. And for Baker, he like, I don't remember all the things he mentioned, but one of them was like the summit, obviously the summit day. Like he had, you know, that was like one of his favorite moments on trail was getting to summit Katahdin. Whereas yeah. like, I don't know if you remember, but I sat down and cried on the way up Katahdin. I had a terrible day. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> so that to be fair, in my opinion, that climb on the hunt trail, you know, up to the summit of Katahdin from what is that Katahdin stream campground there, that last mm -hmm. five miles or whatever it is of the whole Appalachian trail. I think it was like the roughest section of like the whole trail on, or maybe, maybe not as bad as the Mahusik notch, but it's like going uphill or downhill. Unlike the Mahusik notch where you're kind of going flat. Straight. So like you're still going yeah. over boulders and stuff in the Mahusik notch, but like, I don't know that I guess what I'm trying to say here is that climb was like pretty gnarly so yeah honestly I can kind of understand why you were not really enjoying that so much given we've already kind of talked a little bit about how you do not like the uh, more dangerous sections of the yeah. trail like that which I don't think anybody I mean, maybe there's some crazy fucking people out there that like that but I'm not crazy about it either yeah, most people don't get as afraid of it as I was, like, right? And I was a little more afraid than was reasonable. Like, I got passed by two six-year-olds on Katahdin. So clearly, I was more afraid than I needed to be. So. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, it's... Everybody reacts differently to that stuff, honestly. Um, I know for me, I've done a lot of kind of sketchy sections of trail like that with, you know, your full heavy pack, obviously, like we were on our through hikes. And then I've also done particularly in the Adirondacks, I've done a lot of sketchy sections of the trail like that with only a day pack. And honestly, just having a little bit less weight on your back, I think makes a huge difference as far as like how sketchy it is for some reason. I mean, I guess it makes sense. You know, you're not going to like have as much momentum going down i guess i don't fucking know i'm not a mm -hmm. physicist but if you have like a frame pack like mine was you know i had the osprey pack it was a full frame pack and i would keep it so it floated over my shoulders because i any weight on my shoulders gives me a headache and okay. on climbs like that it was an issue because if the pack started leaning one way it would take me with it yeah yeah so like yeah the pack makes a huge difference it's like i've done some pretty like sketchy hikes like that in the adirondacks like I'm trying to think uh Allen, is, which is a 4,000 foot peak in the Adirondacks, was like pretty gnarly, if I recall. There's a couple other ones, like Cliff and Redfield, maybe. I can't remember. Cliff but um, like it would be. Yeah, yeah, I know, right? The, the name Cliff. But, and like, I, I didn't have a full, like, back, like a full backpacking pack on. You know, I just had my day pack. And I don't remember being as sketched out about those, even though they are just about as sketchy, objectively speaking, as sections of the trail, like in the Whites in Maine. I don't know. Uh, I guess since we're talking about, you know, being afraid of sections of the trailer, being afraid of like <laughs> things you encounter, um, that's, you know, fear is kind of another subject that we had considered talking about when we were kind of planning things out for this episode. And it's not something that I've really talked about on any other episode. So I think it'll be cool to cover. So you had mentioned that before you'd set out on your through hike, that there was kind of some fears that you had that were building up that you thought you would need to overcome. Can you just kind of talk about what some of those pre-hike fears, I guess, uh, were and kind of how you like overcame them once you actually you know, got comfortable on the trail? Yeah, so um, I didn't have any like the typical fears. Like I wasn't afraid of bears. I wasn't afraid of crazy people or I wasn't and I wasn't afraid of like the hitchhiking or running out of food or not having water. Um, I had some like really ridiculous fears actually. I have a phobia of bees and wasps and hornets and things like that. Like a like a straight up phobia. Like I almost threw myself off a cliff at one point <laughs> on the trail trying to get away from one. Are there a lot of like bees and stuff in Florida? No, actually, not compared to the trail. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't have to see bees very often in Florida. Um, they are around. 
But I don't know if you remember, North Carolina was like filled with bees. There were bees everywhere, everywhere you went, especially at shelters. I honestly didn't really see that many. I, I got stung. What? How many, or how, how many times do you get stung? I should probably ask you that. I should preface this by saying I have been stung before the trial. I've been stung once ever in my entire life um, because I'm really good at running away from bees. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I actually got a really bad sting. Um, so in Virginia, um, we got picked up by my parents on July 6th to go to just see them for a little bit. Um, and the day we got picked up, which was a 20 point something mile day, I got stung by what we later believe was a bald-faced hornet. I don't know what that is, but it sounds They're painful. especially <laughs> nasty. They're especially nasty. Yikes. Um, yeah, and it was it was so painful. Like I felt like someone had punched me in my calf, where, which is where I got stung. Jeez. And I remember we looked for a snake at first because it really felt like something had struck me. Oh, wow. Um, but there weren't any like puncture marks. Um, and the way it was like presenting looked a lot like when I had gotten stung by a bee before. Um, but I actually still have a scar from it. Like I have oh, a little scar from geez. where it stung me, and it it discolored my like almost my entire calf for like two two almost three weeks before that healed. Um, and That's that was gnarly. painful. Yeah. And so I actually um, from that moment on I was like half joking, but I kind of wasn't that like if I ever got stung again I was gonna quit. <laughs> <laughs> and luckily I didn't get stung again. But I don't, you you know you must remember there were like those hornet nests, those little paper gray ones, and they would be like on the ground like two feet away from the trail sometimes, like especially in Pennsylvania. You guys were like a couple days ahead of me for most of that section, so maybe you guys just like scared them out. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. I don't know. They were everywhere. I got stung in, where was I? I was in New Jersey. It was the day that, I, yeah, it was the day that I went over that like uh, boardwalk section. Yes. Oh my God. Yes. So I, I, we have gut hook, right? And I used to like go through gut hook every night and people would comment where there were bee nests in the trail. And that, that huge long boardwalk, I think it was maybe in Massachusetts. Right before, like, well, before or after New Jersey? I don't remember. But there was one where someone had commented, like, there's a bee's nest under the boardwalk. If you go over it real fast, they don't sting you. But if you stand on it, you'll get stung. So then maybe that's where you got stung. <laughs> it wasn't actually, yeah, it wasn't actually on the boardwalk. It was just, uh, like, right after that. I just remember because I was, that was one of my worst days. I, I think I was, like, kind of getting sick or something. And, oh, like, no. I, I didn't sleep well. And I didn't drink coffee in the morning, which was stupid. I just felt like shit. It was just one of those like really hot, humid days. And of course, on my already worst day on the trails when I got stung in the ear, mind you, which did <gasps> Jesus, not feel no. good at all. Mm -mm, yeah, mm -mm. not a big fan of that. Mm -mm. <laughs> so kind of transitioning back away from, well, actually, no, we're not transitioning away from bees, but we're going to transition <laughs> God, back into <laughs> into fears. So we kind of got sidetracked there talking about the bees. Um, <laughs> so just kind of going back to like the, the whole fears thing. Like, can you just talk a little bit more about like that particular fear of bees and, or, or some of the other fears you had before you set out on your through hike and kind of how you overcame them? Yeah. So um, it, there was, I had the fear with the bees of just like, I knew that I had this phobia and it was, there were going to be bees out there. That would be crazy to think that I wouldn't run across some. Um, but I also had another really irrational fear. And I'm, I'm aware these are irrational, crazy things to be afraid of. Um, but I, I don't have a fear of ants, but I have an issue with ants when they're swarming, like when there's a lot of them. And I had this weird fear, like I was terrified that we were going to do something stupid, like set up our tent on top of an ant hill and wake up with our tent covered in ants. <laughs> it's totally dumb. It's so dumb, right? Like, and so I, those were my two, those were my two big fears. And I looked at them and I looked at those fears and I said, you know what, even if both of these fears happen to us on trail, we're not going to die. So this is yeah. not a reason to not do this. And like, that's kind of what I wanted to talk about. It was like, you know, if you have fears before you're going to go on a through hike or do anything, like take a, try to take a look at them, step back and look at it rationally and decide like, even if these fears happen, like what would be the worst that could happen? You know, like if, if they're not going to kill you, it's probably time to face them. Right. So I was like, I'm not going to let these things hold me back from doing this. And they did both happen. I got stung by that hornet in Virginia. <laughs> and um, there were those nests everywhere in July and August. And, like, I don't know if you remember, they were literally everywhere. Like, there was a bridge in Virginia that had a, a yellow jacket nest literally on this, like, swinging tension bridge. Oh, no, I don't remember that. No, oh, my God. It was, it was one of those things, like, if no one had gone over the bridge before you and you were the first person to go over, you would get past the nest oh, before they'd true. be riled up. Yeah. So, like, that was how I got past. It was like, you know what, I was like... 
I, I did what I call suiting up. So I like put on my wind pants and I put on my rain jacket and I put on every layer I had so hopefully I wouldn't get stung. <laughs> and I ran across the bridge and I get across and I don't hear any buzzing and I'm like, oh man, it's fine. Baker was right. There were no bees. And he comes across and he's like, yo, there were totally bees on that bridge. You were right. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> How did you know there were bees on the bridge before you went across it? Gut hook. Oh, okay, gut hook. Okay. It was during the time when I was checking gut hook for bee nest alert. <laughs> That's so funny. Gut hook is so <laughs> thorough on the AT. It's like literally, it's you amazing. can find out if there's like fucking bees under a bridge you haven't even gone to yet. Like that's, I love that. Gut hook, gut hook rules. Love gut hook. Yeah. So it's like, oh, you didn't even use gut hook. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? That's... But... <laughs> Yeah, and then we also did set up our tent, not quite on an anthill, but, like, right next to one, and I, I started, like, later in the summer doing, like, water baths, where I would, if we were at a dry camp, or if we were to camp with water, I would, like, take water in my bottle and, like, go to an area and, like, bathe, bathe off of it, and I stood on an anthill to do that <laughs> at one point in Pennsylvania, that was great. Um, so, but yeah, so they both happened, and it was fine, like, it didn't end up mattering, you know, so, like, you know, again, just don't let fears be the reason you don't go on a hike, it's not a good reason to not do it absolutely all right let's see here should we talk about gear jessica sure let's talk about gear a little bit now this is something that i i've asked a couple guests in my early episodes about but honestly for like a backpacking like hiking podcast i feel like i haven't really actually talked about gear that much and honestly i think the reason is because number one i just when it comes to you know, trying to be successful on a through hike, I feel like gear isn't like the most important thing. It's definitely important. Yeah. It's definitely worth talking about for sure, which is why we're going to do it today. But it's not like the most important thing. So I kind of just overlooked it because of that. And second of all, I went through my gear phase like years ago. Like I'm telling you, when I first started to like learn about backpacking, as I feel like is pretty normal, you know, I got way into gear. You know, I was spending hours watching gear reviews and, you know, going to all the websites you know i would go into ems or uh, not rei because we don't have them here but you know i'd go into outfitters and just like totally nerd out about all the sporks mm -hmm. and stoves and all that <laughs> st st stupid shit no but... totally totally so i don't know what, I, what i'm trying to say here is like i i'm just not as fascinated and I, and I don't nerd out about gear quite as much as i used to so i think that's kind of why i overlooked it but like i said it is something that is important to talk about and now that it is January, you know, almost late January, I'm sure that there's a lot of people kind of listening to this podcast and taking in through hiking, backpacking related content in general. And I'm sure they have a lot of questions about gear and want to hear people nerd out about gear. So why don't we do that for a little bit, Jessica? Why don't you talk a little bit about, to start on this subject, talk a little bit about your your big four, right? So your tent, sleeping bag, pack, and your sleeping pad. Because I know, and feel free to talk about Baker's gear as well, because I know both of you guys had pretty lightweight setups, like pretty good setups in my opinion. Why don't you just kind of go through like what you guys were carrying for that stuff? Yeah, absolutely. Um, especially Baker had some very specialized gear. Um, I had some, but not quite as much. Um, it helped, first of all, that we could share a lot of our items. So we shared a tent, we shared a cook set, which we eventually got rid of. Um, we started off sharing a filter, ended up adding a second one in. Um, we could share our bear bag kit. So like things like that that add up, which is part of why I was able to get away with having my Osprey pack because it was really heavy. My Osprey pack was over three pounds. It was a three pounds oh, wow. two ounces. Yeah. And that was after I took off some of the belts and whistles. Um, and I just didn't feel comfortable ordering one of those cottage ones that you can't try on first because yeah. I insisted on having a back gap. And the only one that does it is Z-Packs. And I'll be, I mean, they're not going to go there. Um, so, but for our tent, um, we had a Z-Pax duplex, um, which made a huge difference in our base weight and also allowed us to have such small packs. I had a 36 liter pack to start with and the, the pack that Baker ended with was also a 36 liter pack. Um, so we had pretty small packs and yeah. having the small things helped a lot. Between the two of you, you probably had less capacity than a lot of people do just by themselves when they like first yeah. start out on their through hikes, when they head up Springer Mountain with their 80 liter packs and <laughs> their axes and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and it made a big difference. I think it was actually the make or break and Baker being able to finish the hike because, you know, he had those injuries early on and um, getting his, his pack weight down so much, especially in the middle of the hike in the summer when we were doing big miles, um, I think has really helped him stay on trail. Um, so 
I guess for a big four for me, I had I had my Osprey. Um, oh my, I'm forgetting the name of it, but it was it's, it's technically supposed to be a day pack. It's a 36 liter um, men's day pack. Was it? I could be wrong about this. I'm just gonna take a guess. It's not the Talon. It's something. Hornet. Mm-mm. I would never nope. be packing that. I was wrong. Sir. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> True. <laughs> um, I can't. I'll, it'll come to me later. But I had it. I had a Thursday clear Osprey. Um, it's the, it's the men's version of the Kestrel, whatever that is called. I'm googling right um, now. Stratos. Awesome. Stratos. Yes, the Stratos. Stratos. That's what okay. I had. Yes. Um, and then I ha- we had we shared the duplex. Um, and we had, we both had Neo Air Pads. I had the short one to start with, but eventually switched over and started carrying Baker's extra long one <laughs> and using that instead. That's a whole other. <laughs> What's funny about that is Baker is a pretty tall dude, right? Yeah. And Jessica is not as tall. <laughs> so I'm a mini person. <laughs> so I would, I would even say you're on the shorter side. No offense. I'm four foot ten. I'm very short. I'm very short. Okay, well that makes me feel a little bit better. I didn't want to piss you off in the middle of our interview, but no. So <laughs> the reason that's funny is because like there's such a height discrepancy between the two of them, and Baker ends up the, the tall dude ends up with the short pad, and then you end up with the ex not just the the long pad, but like the extra, <laughs> like the <laughs> like that's just, yeah that's hilarious. <laughs> it was it was great, um, but yeah. So I started off with the extra short and wear like the four foot one. Um, and then, uh, what was the last thing? Oh, sleeping bag. So I, I did not buy myself a quilt and that's one of the things I would change if I went back because, um, enlightened equipment does not offer, um, the, a quilt with a closed foot box in my height. The shortest one they offer is five foot six. And I just refused to spend three hundred dollars for six extra inches of fabric and weight. Right. <laughs> so that was my reasoning, which was wrong. Um, but right. I had, um, what was, what's called the Aegis Max, um, sleeping bag, which, um, the one that it's from Amazon, it's like 80 bucks and it's quilt, it's a down, um, sleeping bag and it's, mine was exactly a pound. Um, Baker's came in at a pound and three ounces or something like that. And he didn't end up using it. Um, but so that was the sleeping bag I had, but it's only a 35 degree sleeping bag. Um, which meant in the winter I ended up buying a sheet of fleece from Walmart to line my bag with. Oh, interesting. Which made my whole sleeping setup like almost two, a little over two pounds, which was ridiculous. <laughs> two, you call that ridiculous? There's like so many people out there that probably have like <laughs> three pounds sleeping bags alone, and they're like, "Why does she think that's ridiculous?" Like, no. Because <laughs> well, if you think about it, at four foot ten, like two pounds is two percent of my weight, right? Yeah. And your pack's not supposed to go above twenty percent of your weight, so that's a big percentage of my allowed pack weight um to do that so um those that was what we all that was what we both started with um none of my big four changed except for that sleeping pad where i changed out and took baker's heavier one yeah because apparently i'm even i'm not small enough for the extra small although baker used the extra small for the rest of the trail so i don't know what's up with that (laughs) (laughs) i don't even know what were uh what were some of your other like notable like gear items i guess or just any other like item that you had with you that you liked a lot and you want to talk about a little bit, give a, give a shout out to. Um, yeah. So one of the big things that changed a lot for us over the course of the trail was um, our cook set. So we started with the, um, like I think it was Holly light micro dualist kit. Um, and we didn't take any of the bowls or stuff with us. We just took the pot and we ended up trading that out because it's almost a two liter pot and we never boiled more than like 500 mils at a time because we, we did the cook in bag thing where we would just cook in our nor rice side bag. Yep. Um, so we didn't need a large pot. So we traded that out for a, um, a titanium mug with a lid that we added silicone um, tubing to, to the handles. And um, we also started with a msr pocket rocket stove and switch to the brs stove and i would definitely recommend the brs stove with a titanium mug over any other kind of like pop kit set because it came in together with both the mug and the and the stove at like i think five ounces nice yeah but if i was going to do it again um what i would do is i would just get the Vargo bot and not bring any stove and on nights when i had time cook over a campfire and on nights Ooh. when i didn't have time cold soak um because and then just save all that weight and not have to carry a fuel can or anything like that. Uh, because during the summer months, we actually bounced the, the titanium mug and BRS stove ahead um, and just got talenti jars and cold soap through the whole summer, and that was fantastic. 
You just call cold soaking fantastic. It was great because when it was that hot, do you remember how hot it was? Like a lot of times when we would finally I just... we would have like a little bit of heat exhaustion. <laughs> like I would be overheated and nauseous, and all I wanted was cold food. I did not want any hot food. Yeah, right? no. So like it was great. I feel that. Yeah, honestly, I we've talked or I've talked a little bit with my guests about cold soaking on other episodes, and mm -hmm, yeah, some people swear by it, some people love it. But personally, it's a really personal thing. It, oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I guess on that note, like all gear is kind of a personal thing, but yeah, personally, I, I had the stove and used the stove and never considered getting rid of the stove the entire hike. But you know, I'm also, I would say I'm also kind of a little bit more of a picky eater in general too. My mom will probably have some comments about that when she hears <laughs> this, but uh, I don't know. So yeah, I, I had to have my hot food. <laughs> I had to have my hot coffee in the morning. I don't know, but oh, man, we never bother cooking in the morning. If you can like get away with doing the cold soak thing, then I mean, go for it. You will save, you know, at least a half pound to a pound, depending on what you would have brought for a pot and stove and stuff. So I don't know. It well, is the big thing is the fuel can. That's and the, where you oh save yeah, the weight. that's true. Yeah, because cold soaking doesn't actually really save you that much weight, right? Because a Talenti jar is like three or four ounces, and then you're gonna carry it for an hour in your pack full of water. So it's 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 not as much of a weight saving as I think some people purport it to be. No, that's that's uh, now that I think about it, you're right there. I think uh, I think I was kind of wrong about that, but like I said, I don't cold soak. So I, I guess the biggest like weight saving would be you know the fuel can, and I guess it also kind of depends on what size fuel can that you like have to, because like some people would only carry like the four ounce, like the smallest fuel can that you can get. And then there's people like me that would try to save a little bit of money and just suck it up and carry the eight ounce. And then there's the people that would carry the like 1,000 and a half ounce one that's like huge and looks like a I bomb. The smallest one was eight ounces, but no, but they, yeah, like there's the really big ones. They have like honestly, the only person I saw that actually had one of those was Flossie. So, <laughs> <laughs> and he got it for free too. Like Flossie, I'm not making fun oh, of you. Yeah. It's like. <laughs> You found it in a hiker box or someone gave it to him or something. So that's why you had it. And to be fair, it lasted yeah. him like like 500 miles or something ridiculous like that. That's but that's, I don't know. Yeah. I'm going to not nerd out about fuel canisters too much here. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was say in terms of like um, gear, I think Baker had the more specialized gear. He um, started the trail with um, a ULA own pack, which is already like a cottage company. Um, and he ended up switching to a completely frameless pack, um, to the Gossamer Gear Kumo partway through. And he ended up like switch swapping out a few things. Like we both got rid of our rain jackets for most of the trail, um, and switched to ponchos that we got at Dollar General. Nice. Shout out to Dollar General. Love that Heck place. Heck yeah. <laughs> Heck yeah. Except I tore mine and then had to replace it at a family dollar and couldn't find a good poncho. And Ooh. I had a terrible poncho for the rest yeah, of the trail. Dollar, dollar so General <laughs> is better than family dollar. I will, I will stand by that statement. I'll take that to the grave. Dollar General, yeah. sponsor Trail Tales. <laughs> we also <laughs> um, swapped out our bear bag system for a Z-Pax bear bag kit, and that was awesome. It saved us a ton of weight, and that slick line is clutch. Although, for however long you would have using your bear bag system for. We'll just put it that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, honestly, I don't know if I've ever actually talked about, like, my gear on the show which is ridiculous cause, you have like, specialized I, gear too because yeah because like i you know i had a pretty lightweight I, I think my base weight during the summer before i added a couple extra layers it was probably it was probably around 13 pounds which could all could be lighter but is i would i would consider that ultra light if you don't think that's ultra light you can fucking fight me because <laughs> fuck you but <laughs> we're gonna have to fight <laughs> <laughs> you don't consider that ultra light. all right jessica no! we're fighting <laughs> I hope Baker. I hope Baker doesn't hear this. <laughs> well, because like uh, it's definitely light. Like I'll give you that. It's very very light, especially because you had a hammock system. Like I don't think you really can get below ten pounds with a hammock system. I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe <laughs> we're but getting way too technical I, here, though. <laughs> I mean, that's <laughs> see. This is why I try not to talk about gear. No, just, no, just kidding. But um, I I I would consider my kit ultra light. And so, anyways, I had a ULA CDT backpack, which is a frameless backpack. And I've had this pack. I bought it in 2014. I was, oh, geez. I was, I think I was 17 years old in 2014, 18 years old. May I was 18. Yeah, I was 18 years old. Anyways, I was, I hadn't even started college yet. I bought this backpack and I've used it on every single 
overnight hike that I've gone on since then. Like I've put, I mean, I use it first of all, obviously throughout the entire AT and then on tons and tons of other hikes throughout Vermont and the white mountains and the Adirondacks, you know, while I was in college. And honestly, I could, I feel like I could probably take that pack on another through hike right now. And the reason I'm saying this is because if anybody's ever looking for like a ultralight pack, you know, I'm not even necessarily recommending the CDT because getting a frameless pack kind of is a steeper learning curve, but, um, just look into ULA packs. Like I will, I'm not sponsored by ULA. I'm not sponsored by anybody (laughs) because no one listens to this podcast, but I love that shit. ULA rules. I'm trying to think what else. Oh yeah. Another one of my favorite pieces of gear. Um, my trekking poles again, 2014 before I'd even been on a college campus as a student. I don't know when I was really young, I'm still pretty young, but I bought these, uh, (laughs) lucky cork light trekking poles and again, I've used them on not only every overnight hike I've gone on since then, but every single hike, you know, whether it's three miles or whether it's, you know, a week long or whatever, I've used them so much and they lasted all those hikes throughout the years. And then the entire AT through hike as well. So shout out to Lucky, who I'm also not sponsored by. If they <laughs> want to sponsor me, that would be sick, but I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, definitely recommend those two brands. Um, yeah, I I don't need to nerd out about gear anymore. I don't know. Maybe I do. If, yeah, I think we're good. If people, if people are interested in hearing more about gear on another episode, let me know. But uh, I think we're going to kind of transition into my favorite part of the show now. I think other people like this part. No one's ever actually told me that. But, I mean, the show is called Trail Tales. Come on. Like, you got to get some stories in there. We've already had a few good stories, but I'm going to ask Jessica about some more interesting stories from her hike so on that note i mean i know you've listened to the show before so you kind of know what i'm going to say but any stories at all that you want to talk about hitchhiking hiking people related weather related i don't know something related to your through hike after you got back like i do not care you know what are some of your favorite stories that you would like to share with my Fantastic listeners tonight. Um, so I don't want, we don't want anything crazy. Nothing happened like getting chased by bears or bluff charge. Uh, but we did have one time where um, the first night we were in the Shenandoah. Um, so right around then is, I hate to say it, but that's, we actually hung our bear bike through the Shenandoah, but right after that is when we kind of stopped. Um, but we had one night, our first night there, and I don't know if you remember in Shenandoah, they were like, the trail was kind of lined with those bushes, and you really just couldn't get like off trail, like you can only camp in like little areas where like the bushes were cleared out and then there were still bushes all around your campsite. And so we weren't getting near, nearly as far away from the campsite as we should have been. You know, it was supposed to be 100, 200 feet to pee. And so you know, we're getting right at the edge of the campsite and it's just after dark and it's dark out. And we start hearing, I start hearing something coming through the bushes and I'm like, I'm trying to be chill, right? Like I'm lying in the tent and I'm like, trying to convince myself, that doesn't sound big. That doesn't sound big. It's just something small. It's fine. And there's this thing moving through the bushes. And finally, it's like 20 feet away from our tent. And I'm like shaking Baker. I'm like waking him up. I'm like, that doesn't sound big to you, does it? Mm. And he listens for a minute. He's like, no, that's big. (laughs) And I'm like freaking out because we're in the Shenandoah. I'm like, oh my God, this is a bear. There's a bear coming to our campsite. I don't even know what to do. And so we finally like get the tent doors open and we shine our headlights out. And it's a deer it's this giant stag with like, like a seven point antlers <laughs> and it's in our peace pond digging around and so we're like clapping and we're trying to make noise we're shouting at it and this deer just looks at us and it just does not care it just keeps doing what it's doing trying to get like salt or whatever and it hung around for like 30 minutes making all kinds of a ruckus and so i know it's not like a crazy story but for us it was like it was like a little bit scary, but it was also like really cool because then we were like 15 feet away from this deer for 30 minutes. And that, I don't know, it was really cool. Hearing anything big outside your tent while you're sleeping is always going to be <laughs> something that sticks yeah. in your mind for sure. Yeah. And especially because uh, it was so big too. Like usually an animal like a deer isn't trying to make a ton of noise, but this deer was making so much noise. Like I was like, surely this is a predatory animal because otherwise it would be trying to be quiet. But luckily it was just a deer. Yeah. I saw so many deer through Virginia. I was like, I saw some in Shenandoah where I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm like 99% sure you cannot hunt because it's a national park, but even like on, in other parts of Virginia, you know, going through the, uh, George Washington 
and uh, Jefferson National Forests, which make up a good chunk of the trail through Virginia, where I'm pretty sure you can hunt. The deer, like, still did not give a shit. Like, there was a couple (laughs) times where I would just, like, stop, and I would just, I'd be, like, 15 feet away from them, and I would just, like, look at them, and they just look back at me with their big old deer eyes, and they just don't care. I was like, you are a stupid deer. Like, you're going to get shot one of these days. Like, not by me, because I don't hunt, but, like, you got to be... I don't know. It's just because here in Vermont and other places in New England, I feel like the few times I have seen deer, which it's pretty rare over here for some reason, they always just run away instantly. Like they're afraid of you, but like down in like the Southern part of the trail, I don't know. They just like, (laughs) they just didn't care. (laughs) They'll run right up to you. We had two times where deer came like bounding at us and we were like looking at each other like, do we need to get ready to fight? Like this deer was running (laughs) at us before the deer would like realize we were there and then turn away. But it was like, it happened like twice where we thought we were being attacked by deer. <laughs> Side note, I uh, kind of talking about that snowstorm I was talking about earlier at the beginning of the episode uh, here in Vermont. Yeah, we're getting a ton of snow tonight. I think the whole like uh, northeast New England area is today is January 19th. So I'm sure people listening to this in the area will know what I'm talking about. But I have a friend that's coming to meet me tonight when I'm done recording this and we were texting. I was kind of giving, giving him my address and he said, yeah, I'm on my way now. I was like, okay, drive safe because of all the snow. And I just got a text from him that said, I put my car in a ditch getting towed out in about half an hour. It's not damaged. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Which has nothing to do with this episode. So I'm going to move on from that. But yeah, pour one out for my friend Dan and his truck, which is not damaged, I guess. So only pour one out for Dan. Um, <laughs> yeah, back to, uh, back to trail tales though. Um, uh, crazy fearless deer aside, Jessica, are there any other stories you want to share? I guess. Yeah. So one thing that we found, um, it's kind of like a series of smaller stories in terms of, um, something that we found to be really true while we were hiking. Um, uh, over the course of the trail, like they had, there's a saying that the trail always provides, and I, I cannot stress, like, how true this is. Like, the trail really provides, even when you don't know it's something you need, um, you know, even when it's maybe not something that you thought you wanted or needed. Like, we, I remember in um, Pennsylvania, like, right around the um, halfway point, Baker picks up this um, flag, American flag bandana off the ground. And I'm thinking, like, oh, he's being a good Samaritan. We'll take it to town for a way. We're clearing the trail, whatever. We get to town, and he throws it in the wash, and he's washing it. I'm like, Baker, that was probably somebody's pee rag. Are we seriously going to keep this? And he's like, yeah, I don't know. It could be useful. It says the guy who's, like, you know, not even carrying a rain jacket anymore to save weight. Yeah. But he wants to add this bandana that we found on the ground. But I don't know if you remember, we still had that bandana when you ran into us. We, from that day on, used that bandana at least once every day for pretty much the rest of the trail. Because it was so wet for so long, we used it to dry the inside of the tent. I was yeah. using it to dry my feet. Um, when I started taking water baths, it was my towel to dry off afterwards. Like, we used that thing so much. Um, we didn't even know it was something we needed. Um, and other things like on um, Moose Walk, we didn't need to camp at the top of Moose Walk, but there's one stealth site, quote-unquote stealth site, um, random camp halfway up the mountain by a water source, and we were going to stay there. And we timed it, so we got there before 5 p.m., but somebody, a sobo, was hard in camp there. Damn so Of course it was a sobo. I know. Kidding, kidding. <laughs> of course. Disclaimer, I'm joking. Yeah, to be fair. He, fair and square, that was his campsite. Um, so we ended up having to camp, not having to, but we ended up camping on top of South Musilock, um, which there's a good reason they tell you not to camp above tree line in the whites. And um, we ended up with a water puddle inside of our tent, and my headlamp spent the night in that water puddle and broke. And... Um, <laughs> We were coming down the mountain, and we're like, God dang it, I don't have a headlamp. We need, we're like, it's it's getting dark so early in the night, in the day now, like, I really need one. And I look down, and on this, the descent of Musalak, there is not a headlamp, but like a little pocket flashlight. And I was like, wow, I literally now have a working flashlight. Oh, so there like, you go. It was incredible. And, um, you know, the day of Mahusik Arm, when we came off that, you know, and I had like, um, I ran into like some hikers on the way down, because I'm like trying to get myself together. You know, they had asked me, you know, how are you doing? And I like freaked out at them. And these poor guys are like, I don't know what to do. This one guy is like, uh, I have a honey bun. Would you like a honey bun? And I'm like, no, I don't want your honey bun. I don't want anything. I want to go home. I want to be done. And that day we went into Bethel to do our resupply. And we were supposed to just go 
in and out of Bethel, but we get there, and you know, it's like a 30 minute drive into Bethel. It's insane. Yeah, condition. it's a little bit of a way down there. Yeah, and so we were like, we were like, I was like worrying. I was like, how are we going to get back to the trailhead? We need to like leave now, even though we haven't finished really doing the resupply. And this lady at the grocery store comes by and she looks at us um, and says, are you guys through hikers? And we're like, yeah. She's like, I have a, a bed and breakfast and no one is staying with me tonight. Why don't you guys stay with me and tomorrow morning I'll drive you to the trail. Oh, no way. And it was just like, and I was actually, I wanted to say no and be like, no, we really need to go back tonight. But Baker's like, you know, this is, how can you not say yes? She's being so generous and amazing. <laughs> of course we're going to say yes. So, and so that ended up being exactly like, a, a, I think that was a big reason why I ended up staying on trail was getting to have that rest day and like kind of replenish my reserves before tackling the rest of the next section into Rangeley, which was going to decide whether or not I stayed right, right. on trail. So like the trail, like I just, the moral of all, all these stories is the trail provides, even when you don't know that it's what you need or even when it is something you know you need, like it, it's crazy how true it is. No, it is true for sure. Yeah, that's really awesome. I don't think you guys uh, told me that story before, or if you did, I wasn't listening, or I don't know. But <laughs> that's I don't uh, remember if we did or not. Yeah, I, I don't think you did. I, I, I honestly don't. And that's a, uh, that's really awesome. I mean, what a just a nice, generous lady to just I know like offer up like uh, I, I don't know. I mean, it's so cliche to say that because the communities surrounding the Appalachian Trail are just so amazing and filled with so many just generous people like that. But I mean, that's just, mm -hmm. it's, it always, it always makes me feel good to hear those kind of stories. Um, and it's definitely a selling point for doing a through hike for sure. I mean, for those of you that are listening to this, that are kind of gearing up and getting ready to go out, uh, for the uh, class of 2019, I guess you could say, you know, I'm jealous. I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Like you're going to have some awesome experiences and meet some awesome, awesome people on that note, Jessica, actually, I guess I should say first. Is there any, uh, is there, are there any more stories you want to share? Just the one with the screamo dude and the squirrel tail, but you've heard oh. that so many times. No, no, I, I, I want to hear it again because that's a great story. And I, oh I've got a feeling people <laughs> will kind of like that one too. Oh, and I, I want to disclaimer this with like, this is not what the trail is typically like, but we coming down off of, I think it was the Saddlebacks. Uh, um, it was, um, oh God, it's going to kill me. I, I know it's the one right out of, uh, Rangeley, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, no, it's the one right before Rangeley. It's no, oh, I'm pretty geez. sure it's going out of Rangeley because that was the day that uh, we went to that grocery store together. That the IGA that was like yes, I think that was that was Rangeley. So oh god, what are those freaking mountains? All right, tell your story. I'm gonna I'm gonna Google it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, but so we're we're coming back down off these mountains, and there's this one campsite that got hooked. There's been a lot of comments about like um, don't stay here, it's haunted, whatever. And we're just like yeah, right. It's we were contemplating staying there. We wanted to get past it, but it was getting kind of dark. Um, we get to the area of this campsite, and I'm actually um, ahead of Baker for once, which is unusual. Um, and I get there, and there's this dude on the side of the trail who's literally just screaming. Like, he's I, – I, I can't even describe it. It was, like, it was, like, dual tonal. Like, he was literally – like, it was the strangest screaming I've ever heard. And he makes eye contact with me. And <laughs> I, 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 like, I look at him, and I'm, like, smile and nod. I'm, like, Hi you know, trying to be friendly, even though he's being weird AF. And he has this crazy look in his eyes and just keeps screaming. And as he looks at me and I'm like, oh my God, what is this? So I like booked it past there. I'm like, we're not getting water. Like I'm out of water, but we're not getting water. We're, it's getting dark, but we're not camping. And I get about like, oh, not even 50 feet past him down the trail. And there's this dismembered squirrel tail on the ground. Ooh. And I look at it and I'm looking at thinking, I can still hear his screaming in the back. And I'm just like, what is going on? So I get a little bit further and I pause and I'm waiting for Baker. I'm like, I'm, I'm not moving. I, I want I want him to be here. And he gets there. I'm like, did, did you hear? And he's like, yes. And we, I'm like, did you see the squirrel tail? And he's like, no. So he went back to see to see if he could see it. I was like, did I imagine this? And he's like, oh my god, there's really a squirrel tail there. He's got a picture of it. The, t the picture of the tail is on his Instagram. Um, <laughs> and so we're like sitting there. We're just like, what is going on with this dude? Like this campsite is actually like creepy. Um, and so we ended up making it to where you guys were camped that night, where we had like a million people piled up on top of each other at that yeah, yeah. shelter. I don't remember what it was, but. Um, it's, that was so crazy. Yeah. I, by the way, you were right. It's, it was a uh, saddleback going out of Rangeley. So sorry. I doubted you, thought. but, um, <laughs> I, I recall you guys saying it was like a, like a, like a metal, like music kind of screen. Yes, it, it yeah. wasn't just like, like yelling. Like he yeah, was like doing right. like a lower, like 
like yeah. coming from his yeah, diaphragm. Like, like the grunt screaming yeah. and then like high pitched screaming and like alternating. But it was like when he would do like the high pitched screaming, it was literally like like it sounded like two tones. Like I don't know I, how he was doing that. <laughs> it was so creepy. Shit. Oh I mean, I, I listened to some of that kind of music, so I kind of wish I had heard it. Maybe I could have like recruited <laughs> him and we could have started like an AT like metal band or something. I don't know. Oh my god. <laughs> I mean. It was good. It was actually pretty good singing, but it was just like so creepy that he wouldn't even pause to like acknowledge my hello. And he just he maybe he was on something I don't know. But he he, he was probably like just eyes. so embarrassed that he was just like oh, I'm just <laughs> I'm just gonna own it. Like I'm just gonna show this girl that I belong in the band Whitechapel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. I mean, I'm sure he was like totally normal. It was just like an awkward time to have run into it. But it was just like, man, it was weird. Yeah, that is pretty bizarre. I kind of wish I had been there for that because that sounds hilarious <laughs> yeah oh, must I, have been there when you guys passed because you were only like a few hours ahead of us i remember i passed like the group he was with but i don't he was with the group because oh, was wasn't he time. like on that in that like uh i don't even know what they were like some sort of like trail maintenance group right i think so i think so he had like a shirt on that had their like like yeah i can't remember which organization yeah. it was but yeah i don't either but yeah <laughs> that's hilarious i guess on <laughs> i guess on that note <laughs> Jessica, I think we're going to kind of wrap things up here. So first of all, thank you so much for taking the time. This was awesome. I think this is going to turn out great. I'm really looking forward to uh, editing this for the rest of the weekend. Before we go, uh, I just want to say, do you want to plug your like social media or your uh, YouTube channel or any of that good old stuff? Oh, gosh. You know, I haven't finished the videos. <laughs> so you don't want to plug your YouTube I, I... channel. <laughs> Do you want to plug? No. Do you want to plug someone else's YouTube channel instead, like Logan Paul's YouTube channel or anything like that? Homemade Wanderlust. Yeah, I think hers are great. She does a great job. I think I'm assuming most people have probably heard or probably. seen her channel that are listening to this, but yeah, I I actually just watched a couple of her videos for the first time like two days ago. But uh, I mean, I was I was familiar with her before because like she's one of the most prominent like hiking YouTubers, blah blah blah. But yeah, good stuff. <laughs> Shout out to homemade wanderlust i guess um what about your uh, instagram um yeah my handle is um i actually don't know my handle uh but i i would say you can find i'll, I'll link bakers it and bakers it's more interesting anyways yeah just link it i don't know i don't remember my handle i'll uh, i'll link jessica's instagram handle in the show notes for this go toss her a follow and do all that good stuff um so yeah the last question the final question for the show today jessica what does the future hold for you as far as through hikes and just hiking in general are concerned? I think I heard you mention another video. You were considering PCT 2020, but can I throw at you CDT 2020, PCT 2021? Ooh. I was considering the PCT. I have not put a definite year on it, although somebody did say 2020, so I think that's probably where you got that from. Um, but CDT 2020, that's pretty insane. I feel like most people <laughs> do the PCT first, but... That's crazy. I really hope. I'm. Or I guess I shouldn't assume. Is is Baker gonna go as well? Um, he better. <laughs> he better. <laughs> so I'm going either way. He better come with me. I like that. Good attitude. I I've got a feeling that dude will definitely go because he lives for the trail. Having done oh, yeah. the Florida Trail, the AT, and then half of the Arizona Trail all in 2018. That's nuts. But uh, we talk a lot about that on his episode. So no, that's awesome. I really hope you guys do it and. If and when you do, I am really looking forward to seeing the pictures and hearing the updates and all that stuff. And when you do, when you finish successfully, which I know you guys will, Trail Tales will definitely, will totally still be a thing in 2020. <laughs> so <laughs> when that happens, I would love to have you guys back on the show to talk about the CDT because I have not really done that much research on that trail. So yeah, that would be a... That would be super cool. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. On that note, I think we're going to wrap it up, Jessica. Is there anything else at all that you want to say before we kind of hit pause on the recording here? No, nope, I'm good. Okay. Thanks She's good. Me. I'm good too then. Let's wrap it up. Thank you guys so much for listening, whoever you are, wherever you are. Episode number 13 of Trail Tales. Have a safe rest of your drive or your lawn mowing i guess it's winter so you're probably not mowing your lawn i don't know do people in florida have to mow their lawn this time of year baker just mowed the lawn today baker ju okay well i stand corrected <laughs> enjoy the rest of your lawn mowing <laughs> you're driving you're folding laundry someone told me that's when they listen to the show so i don't know when do you listen to many podcasts jessica when do you listen to podcasts 
Yours is actually the only podcast I listen to. Oh, wow. And I usually listen to it when I drive. <laughs> well, don't listen to any other ones then because you'll probably never <laughs> listen to mine after that. But <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for listening, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day and your life. And signing off now. Peace. Peace.